Welcome to Treaties on Treaties. Episode 3. Theories of International Relations. We have encountered both the concept of states and the concept of sovereignty over the course of the first two episodes of our introduction. Yet we have, as of now, not really taken a look at our central object of study, the international system. If we approached it scientifically, this would be our dependent variable, the one that is being influenced by our independent variables, the treaties. If we call the international system Y, and the treaties X, we know the current state of our international system. Now we have to determine which effects our Xs have on our Y. But what is the international system? How do we define its parameters? I am sure you are not surprised that there is no easy answer for that. Defining the international system of powers and states has sparked debate pretty much since the conception of political science and even before that. In fact, it has been the central subject of discussion over international relations theory. So today we will take a look at four of those theories. After a short introduction of their core assumptions and their concept of the international system, we will try to show their way of explaining things by applying them to a little example. I've picked the Trump administration's exit out of the Paris Agreement as the best choice. Now, before you take to the comments section or the reviews and call me either a fascist or a libtard, please consider this. I'm taking a neutral approach toward this topic and leaving my own opinion out of it. So, everything you hear will be pure theoretical analysis of past events without any ideological standpoint. If you want to discuss your thoughts and feelings, take to Facebook or send me an email at treatiesontreaties at gmail.com. Ready to go? Fine, let's do it. First and foremost, as every university and possibly any textbook on theories of international relation does, we have to address the elephant in the room. The neo-realist theory, as presented primarily by John J. Mersheimer and Kenneth Walls in the 70s, is probably the most prominent theory in international relations, actual foreign policy and popular discussion about it. The theory takes the Westphalian state as its base assumption and deduces an international system from it. Westphalian states function, as we have established last time, in a system that sees war as a totally acceptable rationale to expand their influence and defend their interests. Guaranteeing the sovereignty of states in such a way, the very idea of a regulating or supervising international institution that acts as a world police and protects states according to international rules is unthinkable from a neorealist standpoint. Therefore, neorealism describes the international system of states as an anarchy. What are interests? Neorealists would argue that the supreme interest of every state is its own survival, the ability to guard its sovereignty against any threat and keep its territorial integrity intact. But some might argue that more powerful states do not really mind the sovereignty of states with less power. Neorealists would not argue against this in any way. In fact, smaller states have no agency in this theoretical approach. The neorealist system of the world is a system of great powers who act and smaller states who are, at best, being acted upon. So, how does one become a great power? Well. That is not really that easy. In the old realist theory, you needed to have a military large enough to challenge all the other powers in the world and the ability to finance and maintain it. Only states who are able to challenge each other are a part of this system of great powers and, as such, strive towards a balance of power. Nowadays, neorealists have made that significantly easier. You got nukes? Well, Welcome to being a great power. No matter if you don't have any other military at all, nuclear armament gives you the option to second strike anyone attacking you with fire and fury, and as such makes you able to defend your sovereignty and interests against anyone trying to challenge you, 
as such becoming a challenge for everyone themselves. What's the consequence of this? Mostly that all great powers are living in an anarchic equilibrium of power. Why is it an equilibrium? Because, as military matters go, you can't be certain that you are able to win a war against any opponent. You think you have wiped out all of the enemy's nuclear arms in a first strike? Well, what happens if your spies just overlooked one? The potential damage a few megatons would do to your society simply does not compare to the potential gains you could make by successfully making war. So, the nuclear balance is one of the key principles of neorealist theory. But even before we invented the technology to blast our entire civilization into smithereens in a few hours' time, this concept did still apply to a degree, since no state could be reasonably convinced of victory without complete information, which simply does not exist. This equilibrium can take different shapes, which we have to discuss very shortly. If one state manages to dominate all other states militarily, as the US did after the fall of the USSR and before the rise of China, we talk about the most stable and peaceful kind of order, hegemony. The hegemon is able to defeat all other contenders, even simultaneously, if need be, and as such has the greatest authority in the international system. Every polarization from this point on makes the system less stable and more prone to war. By polarity, the balance of power between two great powers, for example in the Cold War, makes it more likely that one state, out of a reasonable amount of misinformation or overconfidence, goes to war with the other. Balanced multipolarism, with a set of equally strong and balanced great powers entering a voluntary system of spheres of power, as given for example in the Pentarchy after the fall of Napoleon, which we will talk about quite a bit, trust me, is even more prone to war, but not as much as unbalanced multipolarism would be. The state of the world right before World War I, and arguably right now. Can't states just sort out their differences and keep the peace? The problem with that is that states are unable to agree on measures to promote peace and cooperation in the world, because they simply can't be certain that the measures they agree upon will work. Let's put it like this. If you, as a state, enter into an agreement to limit your conventional arms production, who guarantees to you that the other state actually reduces it? What if it manages to hide its arms from your eyes? So you unilaterally reduce your production and, as such, get whipped pretty handily in the next war. Quite the way of promoting peace, isn't it? In addition to that, being insecure about your military strength in comparison to your rivals makes you want to further increase your strength and the associated economic power more and more. Arms races are a very likely concept in a neorealist world, as states always try to increase their relative strength compared to their direct rivals. As such, states always seek to maximize their profits out of actions taken on the international stage. All their profits? Probably not. States do not chase after absolute gains. Sure, those are nice, but if out of any situation you get something worth a million dollars and your mortal enemy gets two, well, you wouldn't be pleased. As such, states always seek to maximize their gains in relation to all other states making gains out of any situation, further hampering international cooperation between great powers. This obviously also means that alliances and almost any other form of cooperation only happen as the result of problematic situations like an attack on the balance of power, as Germany tried twice in the last century. So let's hammer in our little example here. The United States government entered the climate agreement in 2015 as a result of the fear for the nation's survival in case of a climate catastrophe. Yet the Trump administration argued that other nations, like China, did not really reduce their emission of climate-changing gases and their destruction of the environment as not to hurt their economy, while the United States, adhering to the treaty, damaged their own economy. The relative gains between China and the US were not in favor of the US, so the Americans left the agreement. The influence of this theory on world politics 
must not be underestimated, especially if you remind yourself that one of the most fervent students and thinkers of this neorealist theory was nobody else than Henry Kissinger, who arguably shaped US foreign policy like no single person before him. But there are, obviously, different views on the subject of international relations. The next theory, liberalism, as put forward by Andrew Borovchik, agrees on some of the core assumptions of neorealist theory, but puts an entirely different spin on it. In neorealist theory, states are unitary actors, meaning that you could understand a state as a single person acting on a single will and awaiting all interests and actions from a single perspective, that one of the state and the one which secures the survival of the state. Liberalism, however, has an entirely different concept of statehood. While agreeing on the concept that international relations are in a state of permanent anarchy, with no superior institutions watching over the adherence to agreements and being a world police, liberalism sees the interests of a state as an acting organism in international politics as a function of the balance of power of sub-state actors in the respective societies. As such, Moravchik's probably most famous quote is that the state is an object of capture and recapture. Organized interests within the state compete in their bids for power and influence on institutions, which act as a sort of machine that spits out policy in favor of the group currently running the show. It is important to know that not only the size of any social movement with organized interests is important, quite on the contrary. Moravchik makes the argument that, quite probably, smaller groups have an advantage in formulating and lobbying their interests, as there are less veto players inside the organization and it's easier to decide on unitary action. Liberalism would explain former President Trump's exit out of the Paris Agreement by noting that industrial interests to limit green policy together with broad popular movement trying to limit multilateralism and perceived economic damage due to restrictive environmental policing in favor of economic recovery and job creation, captured the state. They did so using the institution called the American Electoral College and turned American institutions, especially the Senate and the executive branch, into machines whose output was policy according to their goals. So far, so simple. Elections win you power. Please remind yourself that this does not only work in democracies, but in any form of government, as hardly any ruler truly rules alone. Any ruler always has to balance the interests of different groups. In other forms of state, the interests of the people might not be as well represented as in a democracy, but they nonetheless can be a force to be reckoned with. Unless other interest groups become overpowering. In a liberal model of international relations, we have to talk about policy interdependence as well. Neorealists would argue that domestic policy and international policy have nothing to do with each other. Liberals would respond that the influence of domestic power capturing processes on foreign policy is very much a thing. After all, electing another party into government can change foreign policy dramatically. In addition to that, Domestic policy in state A does create incentive to change policy in state B. Consider the following example. State A, in the 21st century, introduces a new tax law that is very friendly to companies. State B might be pressured to also adjust its taxes, so its companies won't redeploy their assets into the jurisdiction of state A. So, interdependence works in two ways. Domestic policy affects international relations, because one might believe that state B might be at least mildly annoyed about state A's unilateral decision and might even enter into competition. On the other hand, international policy changes affect domestic relations, as, as nations might be pressured into acting against their own interests. This type of exchange can be considered a function of costs. Which costs would state B have? if it changed policy towards a more company-friendly tax level? Would they be greater than staying at their current tax level? As such, Borovchik defines the liberal concept of power as the willingness to expend resources or make concessions, not military capabilities. 
a state that is willing and able to expand resources and put its own interests in alignment with the interests of other states, a thing that national elites, usually the most influential groups with the best organized interest, usually do, is a state that has the best chances of inserting its preferences into the international system. As such, the balance of power is not a military one, but one based on mediation and international understanding of preferences, where publicly and willingly acting against the organized interests of other states is considered an affront against the system's stability. Ravchik assumes that interests of groups either align or confront, and that, surprise surprise, with alignment comes cooperation and with confrontation comes conflict. Liberal theory models this concept of power by generating so-called win sets. A win set in any negotiating situation is the amount of mutually acceptable outcomes. Therefore, a government with a large amount of acceptable outcomes will, if you imagine this as a Venn diagram, always be an advantage toward a nation with less options, as they are able to take greater utility out of any solution and have better ordering of preferences. Up next, we will have to compromise our understanding of international anarchy a little. Neoliberal institutionalism, as put forward by Robert Kiohain, concedes that there is no organization that actively watches the adherence to agreements, just like the other theories did. It follows the line of the neorealists in assuming that all states are sovereign in a Westphalian sense, and that all the agreements we are going to talk about are not going to bind anyone to their statutes. On the other hand, this theory argues that states organize their coexistence by entering into different levels of institutional arrangements, conventions, regimes and organizations. Conventions are the groundwork of any institutional arrangement and basically the first level. They are based on informal institutions and basic concepts like the norm of reciprocity or diplomatic immunity, hard to grasp concepts that both sides of any agreement have to agree on, as such shaping expectations of what the other side is trying to do, why it is trying to do it, and how it is going to do it. I would like to illustrate this with a theoretical example that our university teacher used to explain the concept which is simple, yet makes the point really clear. Imagine going to a farmer's market to buy an apple. Now, the friendly old lady selling you the apple expects you to do something based on her understandings of social conventions. She expects you to pay for the apple. She expects that you do not try to rob her of the apple, nor that you start insulting her in the process of acquiring it. Possibly, she might even expect you to say hello and thank you instead of just apple. The process of buying the apple might be fortified by repetition of this social interaction, which you could also dub a cooperation. You get something out of it that you want, and the lady gets something out of it which is your money. Repeated cooperation creates new conventions. If you buy an apple every Wednesday at noon, she will expect you to come to her by that time to buy an apple. If you repeat this cycle more and more often, the cooperation will become more and more institutionalized. Maybe you will develop what you could call an inside joke. Maybe you'll start talking about the weather or use a special form of greeting or maybe you'll get a discount. There will always, with each repetition of cooperation, be firmer expectations of roles, i.e. customer and seller, and rules, time, price, content of conversation. As such, the process of you buying an apple has become institutionalized. Now, this is the limit of institutionalization explained by the acquisition of fruit. But institutionalization is the decisive instrument of the creation of an international system. States that can agree on conventions and norms like reciprocity can agree on shared goals and processes to affect certain policy fields. This is what the theory calls regimes. Regimes are policy-related decisions that contain explicit agreements on international issues that are created and adhered to by states. Nuclear disarmament or arms reduction treaties are regimes, as well as environmental protection agreements. Basically, everything that tries to create a solution to a specific challenge. Now, states entering regimes and as such cooperating on certain issues 
will at some point face serious policy interdependence and have created a shared set of values pertaining to issues and their resolution. As such, with increasing cooperation comes increasing institutionalization. For example, if states enter certain trade regimes, like the Bretton Woods Agreement, and constantly act upon the shared rules of this regime, they might want to create a separate body to watch over it and create what is on top of the process of institutionalization, an international organization. Organizations are defined by being entities designed for a special purpose, monitor the activities of states, and have their own bureaucratic function, as well as regular meetings between the participants, or at least delegations from the member states. Yet, obviously not all organizations are the same. Institutions in general can be defined by three criteria. Firstly, their degree of commonality. How much nations are in unison about what they consider appropriate behavior regarding the institution. Secondly, and this is a word that is really hard to pronounce for German, the degree of specificity. How specific the expectations states have towards the institutions really are. Thirdly, the degree of autonomy. How much single states can do to change the rules of the organization themselves. You can see that, given the degree of institutionalization, those things tend towards a specific direction on the scales. While the Convention of Diplomatic Immunity is exceptionally common, quite specific and absolutely not autonomous, the World Trade Organization is not very common, not quite specific, yet incredibly autonomous, as states always try to amend the rules to a degree. This observation, however, is something I consider my own heuristic, and I would be glad to discuss it with someone who has another understanding of how institutions work. It's great that institutions exist, you might say, but what do they do? Institutions organize the coexistence of states by creating a set of incentives that influences how states act and do not act. The organization of the WTO might create an incentive to open your markets to the world, while the organization of the United Nations creates quite strong incentives not to attack your neighbor. So, just as with liberalism, Costs of specific decisions are redefined by the adherences to the rules of organizations and reorder states' preferences if you were to try to order them according to their utility to the state. In addition to this, they influence diplomatic exchange and its interpretation. If a specific greeting is omitted in a diplomatic note, or the President of the European Commission is shoved onto a little sofa by the President of Turkey, this breach of international conventions can be understood as a pretty clear sign something isn't right. Diplomatic niceties are, for all intents and purposes, an institution. This leads us to one of the theory's weaknesses. What is an institution? There's no clear-cut definition. According to the specifics given by Kyohain, pretty much everything is making identifying those of interest and specifying effects without omitting others that might also be of importance quite difficult. It's a little hard to explain the exit out of an institution or a regime using institutionalism. Concerning the Paris Agreement, it might have been that the underlying values of US foreign policy shifted away from multilateral agreements, and that the frequent misunderstandings and destructive discourse between state leaders around the world and the US president destroyed the shared basis of conventions that are vitally important for diplomacy. Different understandings of norms and conventions make for misunderstanding and disunion in action. Finally, we come to the last horse of our little quadriga of theories. Social constructivism, as most famously championed by Alexander Wendt, is, as all other theories before, a systemic theory, meaning that international relations are defined as a system of actors interacting with one another. Again, states are the main focus of its attention, but instead of creating a system out of material assets, like neorealism does, social constructivism creates a system out of intersubjective structures, focusing on identities and their, well, construction. What is an identity? Wendt creates a model in which states create an identity as a corporation, defining themselves over their values and intrinsic qualities. 
The US, for example, would define itself as a capitalist democracy, a member of NATO and of the UN, and so forth. It will also emphasize certain values over others, freedom over religion, for example, and so forth. From this self-definition, states create an image, a corporate identity of themselves, that shapes their own actions and other actors in the system they interact with. These identities, on the other hand, are shaped from the convictions of the elements making up the state, mainly its people. People form societies to fulfill four basic goals. First, the goal of physical security. Second, the goal of ontological security, meaning the goal of independence from others. The goal of respect from other societies, as well as the goal of development, meaning the goal to better their own lives. Fulfilling these goals makes a state, but the ordering of these goals is important for how the state sees itself. States do not define their own identities, but more importantly, they define themselves inside the system and in relation to other states. If two states with diametric opinions on certain values engage with another on a global stage, they will identify to a certain degree with each other, probably negatively. States with corresponding goals and identities probably align with each other and start to cooperate. States continuously negatively and positively identify with each other, but also with certain concepts. Take war as a concept. Nowadays, most states identify negatively with the concept of making war, but go back 200 years and warfare was much more accepted and used in international politics. If states identify positively with each other, they cooperate and pursue, remember neorealism, absolute gains. When they identify negatively, they pursue relative gains, trying to improve their positions in contrast to the other state. These identifications and preferences can be ordered according to their strength. Therefore, unless a state defines itself more strongly negatively with another state, then with the idea or concept of going to war with that state, it will not go to war with it. This complex system of preference ordering allows us to explain why certain states take certain actions. Yet one big problem is that social constructivism can't really make good predictions. Will the US go to war with China? Well, as long as the negative alignment with China does not become stronger than the fear of thermonuclear Armageddon, well, they won't. But that's not really a strong prediction, is it? What social constructivism is great at is analyzing international relations of the past. Take our given example again. The US entered the agreement because the alignment with the idea of saving the climate from collapse was stronger than the alignment of short-term economic goals that had to be fulfilled. They left the agreement as soon as the alignments shifted back, as a new government was inserted into the mix. It is as simple as that and gives a really good entry point for backwards analysis. Why did the alignment shift? What was the breaking point? Social constructivism makes for an interesting theoretical basis to any foreign policy analysis. Now, it would be remiss of me not to mention that there are other ways to discuss international relations. If there are systemic theories, there must also be non-systemic theories with different assumptions of how the world works and how the international community operates. There's a plethora of those, actually. From the writings of the Italian communist Antonio Gramsci to the critical theory of the Frankfurt School of Max Horkheimer and Theodor V. Adorno, those theories of which social constructivism lended its intersubjective approach, for example, are, of course, fascinating ways to explain the world in their own right. Yet, if we want to discover an international system of politics, I do believe that we have to take a systemic approach towards its conception and its growth over the centuries. There is of course a debate about those views of the world to be had, but this will have to wait for another day. I hope you enjoyed this tour de force through a few of the systemic theories of international relations. Obviously, those are long-range theories, not really going into the nitty-gritty but many mid-range theories we might stumble about during our journey through international history are derived from these. 
if you want to discuss my picks for four theories, drop me a line. I'm always looking forward to some exchange about this topic. Next time, we're finally going to jump into our topic. In the first regular episode, we're going to take a closer look at the reasons for and implications of the treaties of Utrecht, Rastatt and Baden, which ended the war of the Spanish succession and can be seen as a great first try at institutional balancing of a system of great powers.